In June 1944, an aircraft entered service that would change the course of history, the Messerschmitt ME-262. This aircraft was the world's first operational jet fighter, and was tasked with saving Germany from the hordes of Allied heavy bombers looming overhead. To these bomber crews and their escort fighter pilots, the 262 looked unstoppable. You'd be lucky to even see it before it tore into you with its deadly 30mm cannons. But there's a reason this new wonder weapon didn't solve Germany's problems, nor was it particularly new. In this video we'll take a deep dive into Germany's jet aircraft, the first of which flew before the war even began. These are the Nazi jets of World War II. To understand the origins of the German jet program, we have to go all the way back to 1933, more than a decade before the ME-262 would enter service. The man we're interested in, Hans von Ohain, was a 21-year-old PhD student, and he had just come up with an engine that didn't require a propeller. Von Ohain would develop the concept over the next few years, and in 1936 submitted a patent for Germany's first jet engine. By 1937, von Ohain had been hired by Heinkel, and by 1939, one of his engines, the HES-3, would power an aircraft for the first time, keeping an HE-118 airborne long after its own engine was throttled down. A brand new, purpose-built aircraft was built around the HES-3 throughout 1939. This experimental jet, not much more than a proof of concept, was known as the HE-178, and was a small, simple design. The jet engine was mounted in the centre of the round metal fuselage, with an intake in the nose and an exhaust in the rear. The 178 had a set of high-mounted wooden wings, retractable landing gear, and a basic cockpit. It didn't need to be fancy, it just needed to fly. And fly it did, with the world's first jet aircraft taking to the skies on the 27th of August 1939, days before the invasion of Poland and the official start to World War II. Heinkel had been developing the 178 in almost complete secrecy. Even the Luftwaffe had no idea that the German jet had just flown. The aircraft was finally shown to the government officials in November of 1939, who actually weren't all that impressed. Novelty aside, the aircraft could only get to about 372 miles an hour, only 20 miles an hour more than a fully combat-laden BF-109, and it had a measly combat endurance of about 10 minutes. Only one HE-178 would ever fly, and despite this airframe being placed in the Berlin Aviation Museum after the test was complete, it didn't survive the war, being destroyed in an air raid in 1943. Despite the lack of official interest in his jet, Heinkel knew he was onto something, and development continued on a new airframe, the HE-280. This aircraft would mount two underwing HES-8s, a further development of von Ohain's HES-3. The engines would be mounted on semi-elliptical wings attached to a slender fuselage, with twin horizontal stabilizers. The rest of the airframe was complete in the summer of 1940, but there were issues with the engines. While the engineers struggled to get the engines completed, the prototype underwent glide tests, with these weighted pods slung under the wings in place of the jet engines. It would be another six months before the second prototype flew under its own power, on 30th of March 1941. And the issues with the Heinkel engines persisted. They persisted for long enough, in fact, that the rest of Germany managed to catch up. See, the Reich Air Ministry had given out contracts to two of Heinkel's rivals, BMW and Junkers, encouraging them to create their own jet engines. BMW's 003 engine would first run in August 1940, with Junkers' UMO 004 following closely behind in October. They weren't even close to being ready for serial production, but it was clear that Heinkel had some real competition. Work continued in all three engine designs, all vying to be chosen to power Germany's first jet fighter, which at this point was assumed to be the HE-280. But somehow, none of these would be the next power plant fitted to the aircraft. Sometime in 1942, the first prototype was re-equipped with Argus AS-014 Pulse Jets. Pulse Jets predated turbojets and were an altogether simpler design. Air is let into the combustion chamber through a valve, mixed with fuel, and ignited, shooting out the back to provide thrust. It's called a pulse jet because this cycle happens in pulses, for this engine, it was about 45 pulses per second. It was not the most efficient design, but it was cheap and easy to manufacture. However, during testing, the bad weather caused the entire airframe's ice up before the jets could even be ignited, resulting in the loss of the prototype. But not the pilot. 
He was fired free of the aircraft in the world's first ejection seat, becoming the first pilot in history to ever make use of one. It was 1943 before the HE 280 was ready for another demonstration, this time in a mock dogfight against a piston engined Focke Wolf 190. It was hugely impressive, with the Air Ministry ordering 20 pre production models, followed by 300 combat aircraft. However, a challenger had emerged Messerschmitt. Messerschmitt's rival design, the ME 262, had first flown on the 18th of July 1942, and used a very similar configuration to the HE 280. A long slender fuselage with twin underwing BMW jets. Original designs for the 262 had these jets mounted at the wing roots, but after seeing the technical issues plaguing Heinkel's engines, it was decided to move the jets under the wings, to make swapping them out and maintaining them that much easier. This would prove to be a very good decision. The BMW jets were heavy, so the wings were swept at 18.5 degrees to try and shift the centre of gravity backwards as much as possible. This design change, almost by accident, would allow the 262 to perform a lot better at high speed by delaying the effects of compressibility on the wing surfaces. A lot was done to try and incorporate these BMW power plants. The issue was that they didn't really work. The engines took a long time to even reach the Messerschmitt design team, and when mounted they had a nasty tendency to flame out, putting both a pilot and airframe at risk. For that first flight in July 1942, the 262 didn't even use the BMW engines and was instead fitted with the Junkers design, the UMO 004. It was soon decided to completely abandon the BMW jets and focus on adapting the 262 to use these Junker engines going forward, as they were slightly more reliable. Heinkel also made the same conclusion, fitting the 280 with the UMO engines after it became clear that the HES-8 wasn't going to be ready anytime soon. The 280 flew well with the UMOs fitted, but they were significantly heavier than the engines that the aircraft had been designed for, so the performance suffered. Especially when compared to the 262, which had been designed from the ground up to use these heavier engines. In March 1943, the Heinkel 280 was cancelled in favour of the ME262, an altogether superior design. Pressure then mounted on the 262 program, which at this point was becoming more reliable, with some of the Junkers engines managing to operate for 50 to 100 hours before maintenance was required. This was a big improvement from needing to be replaced after every flight, and it was looking like the aircraft was nearly ready for production. However, the 004A engine, the one that was capable of 100 hours of use, was not capable of mass production, using an unacceptable amount of advanced strategic materials. The 004B design that would enter production would use far less, but would be a worse engine, needing overhaul after about 10 hours of flight time. The ME262 was, for all intents and purposes, ready to go by about May 1943. However, neither the materials or manpower were yet ready for mass production, and the jet's debut was further delayed by Hitler himself, insisting that the fighter be adapted for use as a fighter bomber. All of this meant that the jets didn't reach frontline units until at least April of 1944. These production aircraft, known as the ME262 A1A Schwalbes, or Swallows in English, were incredibly impressive, and recorded their first kills in June 1944. The aircraft was almost too fast for its own good, forcing the pilots of the jets to change tactics, developing their own methods in an attempt to increase the amount of time that they could keep their 30mm cannons on a target before they had to pull away. Later models would employ unguided rockets, firing them into a packed formation of bombers before commencing a standard attack run with their Mark 108 cannons. As the 262 pilots learned how to get the most from their aircraft over the coming year, the escorting P-51 pilots learned how best to distract, evade or destroy the oncoming jets, drawing them into low speed turning contests and raking the fighters with their 50 caliber machine guns. The jets ended up on top however, using boom and zoom tactics to stay far away from the piston engined escorts. The vast majority of 262s were destroyed during takeoff or landing, where their slower speeds made them extremely vulnerable. In fact, as soon as an ME-262 was spotted airborne, Allied aircraft would race to their base, attacking the jets as they came in to land. Around 1400 ME-262s were produced before the end of the war, but issues with sourcing and maintaining the UMO 004 engines meant that only around 100 were active at any given point. It was a great aircraft at the time, boasting high kill ratios, but Germany just couldn't make enough of them to impact the war and it was time to explore other designs. 
Although the Allied bombers were, of course, a huge issue, Germany's next jet aircraft would be given a different mission, reconnaissance and light bombing. The Air Ministry had released a request for jet part recon aircraft as early as 1940 and received only one response, from Arado, with their E-370. The Air Ministry liked the design and would order two prototypes of the aircraft that would be known as the AR-234, which would first fly in June of 1943. The 234 was larger than the HE-280 or the ME-262 but used the same engine arrangement, a BMW jet under each wing. These would soon be swapped for the UMO-004, just like on the ME-262. The rest of the design was relatively simple, high-mounted wings and a slender fuselage mounting a conventional T-shaped tail. To save weight and increase speed, the Arado would not use retractable landing gear, it would actually take off from a wheeled trolley which would be jettisoned as it lifted off the runway. On landing, the AR-234 would use three skids to come to rest, one under the fuselage and one under each engine nacelle. Landing a jet aircraft with no ability to brake was apparently a unique experience. The AR-234B would see the aircraft redesigned, with fully retractable landing gear and external bomb mounting points allowing it to be used as the first jet bomber. AR-234 reconnaissance aircraft would enter service in the summer of 1944, conducting high-speed reconnaissance flights over France and the United Kingdom, which the Allies just had no way of stopping. The bomber variant would arrive a few months later, and would see combat against Allied units during the Battle of the Bulge. Famously, AR-234s attempted to destroy the massive Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen in March of 1945, which would collapse after a few weeks of almost constant attack with the Luftwaffe losing a large number of jets in the process. Just over 200 Arado 234s were ever completed, with very few actually seeing service. The rate of attrition on the UMO engines was immense, and many airframes simply never received them, having to compete with the ME262 for engines, fuel and parts. The C series of the 234 would see the aircraft mount four BMW engines instead, but this came too late in the war to change anything. The next German jet, first flying in September 1944, really highlights how desperate the Germans were at this point in the war. Starting in June 1944, they had begun to deploy the first of their vengeance weapons, which was formerly known as the Fiesler Fi-103, but often referred to as the V-1. The V-1 was essentially a cruise missile, powered by the Argus Pulse jet I spoke about earlier. It was launched in France, flew over the channel, and then was guided by its simple autopilot to its target in London where it would crash into the ground and detonate its 850kg warhead. However, the V-1 was inaccurate. In fact, early missiles could land anywhere in a 10 mile radius around the target. The technology for precision guided missiles just wasn't there. So, the Germans did something they probably would have considered unthinkable just a few years prior. They added a pilot. The Fi-103R Reichenberg was a human guided bomb, built to attack Allied shipping during a potential amphibious invasion something that was impossible for the conventional V-1. Technically, the Reichenberg wasn't a suicide aircraft. The pilot, after the jet was released from its mother aircraft, would be trained to aim the vehicle and then bail out moments before impact, but it's questionable how realistic this would have been. The pilots were said to be volunteers of the fanatic Leonidas squadron, who were willing to give their lives for the Reich. Luckily for them, the Reichenberg was never deployed, with Germany viewing the project as an unnecessary waste of trained pilots and resources and they opted to continue with the Mistel project instead. This entire time, throughout the Arado 234 and Fiesler 103R projects, Germany was still struggling to get enough fuel and engines for her Messerschmitt 262s, which seemed to always be in for repairs or maintenance. Creating another design using the UMO engines would only make the problem worse, so it was decided to create a new fighter aircraft using the ill-fated BMW power plant that was finally beginning to show promise. This aircraft, known as the Volksjäger, or People's Fighter, was designed to be incredibly cheap, easy to build and easy to fly, being manufactured and flown by relatively untrained personnel. The design that won this contract was another Heinkel, the HE-162. The 162 would use all the lessons of the failed HE-280 that we went over earlier, with the same twin tail, tragical landing gear and the existence of an ejector seat. The ejector seat was somewhat of a necessity though, as the location of the jet engine on top of the fuselage meant that any manual bailout would likely end in disaster. The simplicity and basic construction of the HE-162 is best highlighted by the fact that the entire wing assembly was attached to the fuselage by four bolts, and a lot of structural components were held together by plywood glue. 
See, the jet had gone from drawing board to first flight in less than 90 days, with the design being chosen in September and the maiden flight occurring on December the 6th. In the meantime, the factory that made the glue that held the aircraft's frame together had been bombed, and the replacement glue that was used in these early prototypes was actually acidic and ate through the wood. A lot of the aircraft were lost and test pilots were killed before they discovered their mistake. These kinks, if you can call them that, were eventually worked out, but it was clear that the aircraft, while extremely capable, was not the easiest to fly, and the original plan of putting barely trained Hitler Youth pilots in them was probably not going to work out. The first 46 aircraft were delivered to their units in January of 1945, first seeing combat in April when it began to score kills. The month of April would see the unit lose 13 aircraft and 10 pilots however, with only two of these actually being shot down. The rest were lost to structural failures, flameouts, and during dangerous dead stick landings after the aircraft had run out of fuel. After all, the BMW engines were fuel hungry, and 162 could only stay airborne for about 30 minutes. The unit would not get a chance to use the aircraft to any great effect, with the unconditional surrender of Germany happening barely a month after they entered service. There would be one last hurrah for Nazi Germany's jet program, the Houghton HO-229. This aircraft, while never seeing service, was a prototype flying wing fighter bomber that first took to the skies in February of 1945. It had been designed as a response to the 3x1000 requirement of 1943, an aircraft that could carry 1000 kg of bombs for a distance of 1000 km at a speed of 1000 km per hour. The Houghton brothers, both BF-109 fighter pilots themselves, had been working on a flying wing design even before the war had begun, and submitted their design for the 3x1000 requirement. The UMO 004 engines that powered the 262 had the potential to reach the 1000 km per hour requirement, but as we know by now, they weren't the most fuel efficient, so the design had to be optimised for aerodynamic efficiency and low drag, hence the flying wing. The Houghton brothers would build the first two prototypes of the aircraft, with the V1 being an unpowered glider, and the V2 being the first to actually fly under its own power, which was lost in a fatal crash in February of 1945. The V3 prototype was actually built by Goza, who were to take over testing and manufacturing for the rest of the prototypes. This is why the aircraft is sometimes referred to as the Gotha GO229. The V3 prototype was a much more mature design, adapted for mass production with revised intakes, the engines being moved forward, and two UMO 004B engines installed. It never flew, however, with the airframe being captured by the Allies in the late stages of production. And that was it. The war was over, pens down, no more jets. It's important to note that the six airframes I've talked about in this video were just the most mature designs. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of German jet designs that never made it off the drawing board. These designs and their designers were scooped up by the invading Allies, who were more than happy to overlook the horrific crimes of the Luftwaffe in order to get an edge in the Cold War. We have to remember that almost all of these jets, had they entered production, would have been built by slave labour. In fact, it's estimated that between 35 and 50,000 people died in the production lines of the ME-262 alone. The Allies would of course produce their own comparable jet aircraft during the war, namely the Gloucester Meteor and the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star. The fact is that the Allies simply didn't need to build slave labour wonder weapons to win the war, and despite the incredible engineering behind the Nazi jets, they were doomed from the very beginning. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing as I'm hoping to make more aircraft content in the future. Until then, leave a like, hop into the Discord, and have a look at my other videos. I'll see you in the next one.